Good morning. We are so glad that you are here today. Now, if you're looking around and you're seeing some seats, just imagine that those are filled because actually we have over 90 individuals that are at Recharge this week. So we've got a lot of individuals that are worshiping in various different places. We're glad that you are here to worship with us and celebrate today. Let's stand as we prepare for worship this morning. And as we do, let's look to the Lord in prayer. Master, we give you praise today for the opportunity to step into your house. We pray, Father, that you would speak to us heart and soul today and you would accept our presence and our worship as a pleasing offering unto you. We give you praise, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. 
another chance to lift our voices to the Lord in praise and worship in Him. My name is LaVon, and we're so glad you joined us for worship today. As we've been singing today, He is worthy. He is worthy of our praise, and He is holy. So take a moment and greet those around you.
Well, we've got just a few announcements. I've already shared with you that we've got a large number of individuals that are recharged today. I also want to point out to you that WOW and We Wow begins this Wednesday from 6.45 to 8.15. We've presently got 26 children that are signed up. We're always looking for more children. And if you have children in first grade through sixth grade that you would like to have involved in this if you could contact Devon or the office and can I clarify real quick yes okay wow and we wow is for any children on Wednesday nights who come um, it's ages three through sixth grade and then that material that we study if you want to going into children's quizzing that's where we have you sign up for that. Oh. That's where we have 26 kiddos signed up. And I think we have three more that haven't signed up yet that they have quizzed in the past. So we might have 29 kids quizzing. So um, you're talking about 26 quizzers. Yes. Outstanding. Yes. Okay, Super thank exciting. you. Yeah. See what happens? She's got to bail me out all the time. Okay, this is an exciting day because the restrooms are working. Woo-hoo! We're excited about that. Now... I wanted to share something with you real quick. I took a, a group of uh, young people and young adults on a work and witness trip to the Pima Indian Reservation uh, early in our ministry. And I noticed that during the service while I was preaching, in groups of three and four, they would get up and they would leave and they'd be gone about, oh, three minutes and they would come in and sit down and then another group of three or four would get up and leave and go in and come back and that went on through the entire service so I approached the missionary there and asked what what what's going on what's what's happening why are they doing that it said well this is the Indian reservation and this is the only place on the Indian reservation that has running water and so they get up in the middle of the service and they go into the restroom because they are fascinated by watching the water swirl <laughs> and so I just want to let you know the restrooms are indeed functioning and if you desire to go in and watch the water swirl that'll be fine but I would encourage you to do that after the worship service if you would please Okay, let's see if we can get a little more serious here for just a minute. Let's continue in worship and celebration today through the celebration of our tithes and offerings. If I could have the ushers, please, this morning. And we need ushers. Okay, this happens when you have 95 people that are gone. Thank you so much for jumping up and helping like that. I really appreciate it. Look at this. That's the way you all are. Thank you so much. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 and 7 records these words. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Ma Master, I pray your blessing upon this offering and that it would be used in a way that would honor you. We love you, Lord. You have demonstrated your love to us over and over again. It is our desire to demonstrate our love to you at this moment. Bless this offering, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.
Greatest of all, all. 
good for us as we gather together to enter into a spirit of worship and a spirit of prayer. I know that there are individuals within the congregation who are going through difficulties or struggles or perhaps want to lift up family members that haven't come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. If that's you today, I encourage you to come to this altar of prayer and kneel before our God. Master, we cherish the time that we get to come and speak to you, listen to your heartfelt, audible voice. We are grateful that we can come. And as we lift up our need before you, we never find you too busy to listen. We never find you busy with something else. That we receive your full attention. We are grateful for your love and for your mercy. I pray, Father, I pray that today that you would prepare us right now, heart and soul, that we would be able to receive your word. And Lord, whatever we are going through in our lives, whatever the context of our life is, I pray, Lord, that you would speak clearly to us today. 
Lord, we especially want to remember those individuals that have faced tragedy over this last week. We want to lift those up in El Paso that are dealing with this event that has taken 20, at least 20 lives. There are others that are injured, and the families that are devastated in a community that is hurting. And we also want to lift up Dayton and the loss of those nine lives and, and what is taking place there. I pray, Lord, that your presence would be recognized by those individuals, that they would feel your arms around them. Lord, we pray for that very same thing for us today. We pray for those that are kneeling in an altar of prayer. And Lord, you know what they're lifting up, the needs and concerns that they have. And, and I pray, Father, for a special touch from you. Meet each need. Draw close to them. Hold them close. Lord, I pray for those those that are standing in our sanctuary, our children that are worshiping today, I pray, Father, that you would be with each and every individual and that you would speak to us in a way that so that we would not only hear but that our walk, our journey with you would be changed. You are good to us. Each and every breath that we breathe, we do so because you will it so. And we thank you for it. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us today, Lord, and have your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, in a few minutes, we're going to be taking a look at Matthew, the 14th chapter, verses 13 through 21. So if you would des desire to follow along, read in your text, I would encourage you to find it at this time, Matthew, the 14th chapter, verses 13 through 21. Well, years ago, I was an associate pastor at the Hillcrest Church of the Nazarene in Alton, Illinois. Church was not like this building. This building, we've done an excellent job of laying it out, thinking it out, putting a master plan together, making sure everything works well together. That was not the case with the Hillcrest Church of the Nazarene. The Hillcrest Church of the Nazarene was built on a hill. Go figure. It was built on a hill. And every time that they put a new unit on, it was just like they... It's like they took Play-Doh Play and just threw it at the hill. Just, and it was just, it, it made no sense. You'd walk from one unit to the next, and when you'd walk into the next unit, you wouldn't even recognize it as the same building. It's very, very difficult to get around. It was like a great maze. So much so, I was a youth pastor in those days, so it's been a day or two. Uh, so much so that my predecessor... When he had first arrived, his first week uh, there as youth pastor, he had become lost in the maze of the church for an entire morning trying to find his office. Well, while I was there, we had a, an interesting uninvited guest a human guest living in the church. We called him the shadow. We weren't quite sure who he was, but we knew he was there. He would, we would leave in the early morning hours after working on a special ministry and, and with everything cleaned up, ready for the next day, only to arrive at 7 o'clock in the morning to find a french fry wrapper on the table that we had been using the night before. We could tell where he slept, but not how he got in. Often, I would be in my office and see the form of an individual whoosh by 
And I would run out into the hallway, chase him down only to lose him in the maze of the church. While pastoring in West Virginia, I received a plea for food one day. Family had three mouths to feed. They were polite, they were reasonably clean and obviously hungry. They clearly had limited resource. I tried to meet their need in many ways. Have you tried the Salvation Army? Yes, we tried, but with no response. Well, we have very little in the pantry, and what we have won't meet your needs. Let me see what I can do. So I took their address, went to the store to buy milk and bread and peanut butter and jelly and cereal and some staples, and I put a few items together, and I, I drove to the place where they were living, and I dropped the foodstuffs off before returning to my own evening meal you could see their faces just light up as if I had just provided a banquet. You'd have thought that I had invited them to a five diamond restaurant. Well, I made my way to the fellowship planned for the evening, but my thoughts kept returning to the hungry family. Questions raced through my mind. Is Jesus pleased with my response? Should I have done more? Did I stop short? Well, the answer was clear. Yes, I did. But what was missing to the response for the family? I'd met the need of the hour, they'd been fed. I'd left them happy at least for the moment, so what was missing? Well, today, I wish for us to take a journey together. A journey with a companion that we rarely see. A companion who hides in the shadows and lurks around the corners of the very building in which we now sit. A companion known as you. In just a second, we're going to be reading the text for the day, Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 through 21. <clears throat> but I want to set the stage and put this in context for you. Jesus had sent his disciples out. It was their first time in ministering without Jesus. He had sent them out, and they were all returning. They were excited to share with him all that had been taking place while they were out ministering. But at the very time that they are arriving, there's another group that is arriving. It's the disciples of John the Baptist. And they are arriving, they have traveled up to Galilee specifically for the task of telling Jesus that John the Baptist has been beheaded. And this is where we pick up this passage of Scripture. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. And hearing of this, the crowd followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so that they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. And then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up twelve baskets full of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those 
who ate was about 5,000 men besides women and children. May the Lord bless the reading of his holy word. <clears throat> well, Galilee must have been a place where it was very difficult to be alone. It was a small region, only about 50 miles from north to south, 25 miles east to west. The dimensions aren't quite accurate, but actually that's pretty close to the greater Kansas City area. Josephus, the great historian, tells us that there were in this small area 204 towns and villages. Each of the towns and villages had a population of at least 15,000 people. And in an area so thickly populated, it must have been very difficult to get away from people for any length of time. It was, however, quiet on the other side of the lake. Now, <clears throat> the lake at its widest was about eight miles. And Jesus, having many friends that were fishermen, would have had little difficulty in borrowing a boat. And when the word came to Jesus concerning the beheading of John the Baptist, Jesus, using a friend's boat, took for the other side of the lake. There were three clear reasons why Jesus would go to the other side. First, he was human. He needed rest. Second, Jesus never recklessly ran into danger. He didn't want to share the same fate as John, at least not yet. And third, and most of all, the cross was coming closer each and every day. He knew he must meet with God before he met with the people. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> perhaps the day will come when we'll focus on those three, but not today. For as Jesus lands on the other side, he finds that people have sought him out and are waiting for him at the bank of the lake. In the midst of Christ's need to be alone, in the midst of his need for personal rest and infilling, Jesus sees the multitude. And having compassion on them, he heals their sick. The disciples see the need of the people as the day rolls by. They realize that these people are going to need to be fed. But their food supply is not up to the task. How do we respond? Well, the answer seems clear. Send them away. But Jesus doesn't seem pleased with that answer. They don't need to go away, he said. You give them something to eat. My friends, I see within this passage a reflection of the companion we spoke of just moments ago. I see a reflection of you and of me. The response of our companion is really quite normal. The task seems so great, the resources seem so small, how can I possibly make a difference? Well, you know, it's, it's easy to make a difference when we talk about feeding the world. We kind of think about those things in abstract terms. We do, really do make a difference in that area. I hope you realize that. As a church, we provide clothing and housing and food for literally thousands of people through the outstretched arms of the Church of the Nazarene every year. Locally, our congregation provided over 11,000 meals last year to individuals in need. Yesterday alone, during the Olathe Baptist School event, we provided 1,800 meals to those who are hungry. We've helped those who face tornadoes in our own community 
hurricanes on the coast of the United States and abroad. The tsunami in Japan and the aftermath of the nuclear meltdown of their power plant earthquake victims in California, famine victims in Ethiopia and Haiti, medical care and facilities in Swaziland, Papua New Guinea and other needy areas around the world. We do make a difference. But just as I did when I was ministering to the family that came to the church for food, so also you and I have fallen short of meeting the need. The need of sharing the message of God. The message of love. The message of forgiveness. The message of the future. And it's here <clears throat> that we come face to face with the truth that is at the heart of the church. It is true that the disciples who the disciple who sees the need of the people is still helpless to meet the need without the Lord. But it is also true that the Lord's chosen response is through his disciple. For if Jesus wants something done if he wants a child taught or a person helped, if he wants the gospel message shared, then he typically gets a person to do it. We need people through whom he can act and through whom he can speak. And it is here that I wish to pause and caution our congregation as a body of believers. It is possible for us in our zeal to do a good thing to miss the mark entirely. You see, the world watches us to see if Christ truly lives in our heart. And this can be a difficult thing for the believer. We must remember that God is still teaching even the sanctified in order that our heart will beat with the heartbeat of God. <clears throat> Are you familiar with the term relativism? Relativism is defined as the doctrine that knowledge, truth, and morality exist in relation to culture, society, or historical context and are not absolute. I'm going to read that again. The doctrine that knowledge, truth, and morality exist in relation to culture, society, or historical context and are not absolute. I want you to understand that our life as believers is not based upon relativism. Relativism is nothing more than creating a way to try to have things the way we want them to be. To rewrite history. But try as people might, the Holocaust did occur. Jews were gassed and burned alive. Slavery did exist in the United States. It was terrible. It was wrong. But we must also note that the early American history reveals that all races were enslaved, including Caucasians. Historical text does not tell us what pigmentation we would have found on our Lord Jesus Christ. But we certainly have a lineage that tells us that he is in the line of David. That's revealing to us. But it doesn't tell us really what pigmentation he had, but one thing we are sure, he wasn't white. 
truth you see cannot be rewritten to match what you want to believe. That's what makes it truth. We do not hold to relativism. Truth does not change. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And this is why the church operates as a body. This is why within the church we have an organizational structure and form. This is why the pastor in the church of the Nazarene is to be an individual genuinely called of God. He or she is president of all organizations, chairman of the board, chief executive of the church to assure that the work through the church is directed by God and to protect us from God's work and to protect it from us. It's so important that we recognize this, that the structure is in place to protect us from ourselves, lest in our desire to help another, we unintentionally injure them. We elect members to our church board with the expectation that they will use wisdom and restraint in their decision making. Remembering always to demonstrate the love of Christ to those within our community. Our God-given assignment is to work as the body of Christ. So that they may see Christ. A word of caution. This particular congregation is a very healthy congregation. Probably the healthiest congregation that I have seen in my ministry. It, you are good people, solid people, and you love each other. But it is good for us to remember and to be cautioned that church struggles rarely come from outside the congregation. Almost always, church struggles come from within a congregation. And this is why it is important that we act as a body of believers and we do not overstep, even with good intention, God's leadership within the church, which includes many checks and balances, as we listen for the direction of God. We must remember that we ourselves, every one of us, are part of the family of God. We are part of the family of God because that unmerited favor from God that's offered to others, yeah, that's the very same unmerited favor that He offers to us. The disciples were often more apt to show discretion than to show faith. And we're not all that different. <clears throat> if they need the bread that perishes for their survival, how much more do they need the bread that leads to eternal life? If we need the bread that perishes for survival, how much more do we need the bread that leads to eternal life? The lesson that he had for the disciples on that day was simple, really. It's the same lesson that he has for us. Jesus needs disciples. Those committed to the task through whom he can work. He needs followers to whom he can give in order that they might give to others. Without being such followers, we stifle the growth of the kingdom. It's our task to be such followers for him. I know what you're thinking. Hey, Pastor, I, I'm not a, a great speaker. I'm not a, a gifted teacher. I feel uncomfortable in crowds. My job demands a lot of my time, and I enjoy my time of leisure. 
I come to church, I tithe my income, and I help out from time to time. What more does he want? He wants you. He does not demand from us splendors or magnificence that we don't possess. He simply says to us, Come to me as you are, however ill-equipped. Bring to me what you have, however little, and I will use it greatly in my service. For little is much in the hands of Christ. This miracle feeding of Jesus was not just a physical feeding. The real feeding that's taking place is spiritual. It was the pouring out of Christ first to the disciples and then to the multitude. It was not meant only for those on the mountainside. No, we must never be content to regard the teachings of Jesus as something that happened. We must always see them as something which happens. They're not isolated events in history. They are demonstrations of the always and forever imperative power of Jesus Christ. The people are hungry. We are hungry. We're hungry for the food of God as well as for the feeding of God's word. But we'll never be filled until we are willing to follow God's leadership. People gathered in groups on the side of the mountain. <clears throat> Jesus gave thanks for the gift of his food and he gave it to his disciples. The disciples then faced the decision that would change their lives forever. You see, they too were hungry. They'd been on a long journey. The day had really gone on. Should they eat the food themselves or pass it on? There was a man who was lost in the desert. His tongue was parched and his lips cracked from the heat. He found it becoming more and more difficult to focus on his journey until near exhaustion he spotted an old mine. Summoning his last ounce of strength, he made his way to the mine in hopes that he might find water. In an old shack, he found a pump with a note attached. To have all the water that you want, follow these directions. Two feet down from this note, you will find a jar of water. You have two choices. You may either drink the water, which will indeed cool your tongue for the moment, or you can take the water in the jar and prime the pump in which case you can have all the water you desire you'll be able to fill the jar again and put it in a safe place so others can be saved as well be careful as you make your decision for you may think that there's not enough water to prime the pump your body will cry out for the water but to have all the water you want follow these directions you must first use all the water in the jar to prime the pump let's stand together would we please I want to close today with this question my friend do, do you long for living water do you ache for a deepening relationship with our eternal Lord? For those who do, here is the solution. You must first pour out all the living water that you possess into others. For the fresh supply of God's living water is the byproduct of its continual flow. Master, 
we give you praise for the way that you reveal yourself to us. Praise for caring for us and coming after us. Praise for having patience with us. Praise for knowing what you know about us and coming anyway. You are great and mighty. Lord, we confess before you that as hard as we try, we know that there is more that we need to do. There is more to learn from you and more we can do in our service for you. I pray, Father, that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon your people. And not just today, but in the days to come, I pray, Lord, that you would speak to them concerning how they might be used for you. And that the question that would loom in their mind would simply be, what do you want of me today? Not yesterday, not last week, not five years ago. But what do you want today? Pour out your Holy Spirit, Lord. Continue to speak to us as we journey. And Father, we give you praise for what you are doing in our hearts and lives even today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. If you would remain standing as Pastor Kathy gives the benediction. Please receive this benediction. May you never be overwhelmed by the needs before you and all around you. Be confident in the power of God working for you, in you, and through you for the fulfillment of his good plan.